in the swampland. Step to the left, step to the right, and you're sunk. So, and I could only be adequate to the storyline. I could not get off on tangents. I could not start talking about something that does not have direct bearing upon the storyline. But then one sentence, another sentence, another sentence, and there is a row of sentences, brick by brick by brick. You have a paragraph, and then you have another paragraph, and that's how the wall is built. And then I went to the graduate writing program, as I said, and there I started writing stories uh, with more and more confidence, and they started getting published, and then book got published, and so forth, and the rest is kind of history. But um, when I was um, in the Soviet Union, I was uh, actively participating in something called Samizdat, which in Russian is uh, acronym for self-publishing, Samizdal and uh, published an underground literary magazine, and so forth. And so I started doing exercises maybe 10 years ago, and this is this book, essentially, where I uh, essentially was trawling my memory for hot points of recollection. And I would give myself a certain time limit, and I would write a story immediately into the status box on Facebook, let's say in two hours two and a half hours, depriving myself of the possibility of endless rewrites, uh, just giving myself an opportunity to correct spelling, syntax, and so forth. But otherwise, the story would have to be so close to the surface of my mind as to come out in its entirety almost, a recollection. And so I started writing those stories and felt that it was another iteration of some as that, self-publishing, because Facebook. It's not publishing, but I have a fairly significant number of followers, and if enough people like the story, it's probably more people than will read it in like respectable literary magazine like Massachusetts Review. Okay, so um, so I started writing those short stories, and uh, you can see lots of them, maybe 12, 13, if you go on the NewYorker.com site uh, with my name, and you'll see those stories there. Many of them are in this book. It's what is known as today in uh, North America, a genre called autofiction, autobiographical fiction. It's not an oxymoron, it's not a contradiction in terms. Um, our life is fiction, in a way, and it's interesting to talk about difference between nonfiction and fiction, it's just in terms of each genre's relation with the reader. Nonfiction writer generally does not play games with the reader and enters in sort of like unspoken, implicit compact with the reader saying, you may not like my point of view, you may not care for my story, but I'm not going to play games with you. This is what I want to say. Take it or leave it. Fiction does not answer any questions like that. Fiction just poses questions. And so when fiction is based on memory, it needs to be understood that memory, of course, is unreliable. Memory, of course, is a form of imagination pointing backwards. It's vector pointing backwards. But it's the only thing that we have. Factually, it may not be correct. This may not be how it actually happened. And how it actually happened is immaterial as far as the reader is concerned. The reader only is concerned whether it's interesting or not interesting to read. Whether it's actually happened or not actually happened, the fact of our own biography. The reader doesn't care. So, <clears throat> so um, those stories mix um, imagination, and the way I remember things in this particular. There are, there are pieces that are much more imaginative. Like for instance, the title novella is just me imagining my grandparents in 1939 during the St Stalinist terror, big terror. So, but otherwise, these are stories that I sort of like took as a recollection and then reinterpreted in some ways, right? It's understood that, when, for instance, when we quote verbatim conversation that took place even five days ago, we don't remember our conversations verbatim even five days ago, let alone five years ago, let alone 25 years ago, right? The reader accepts that kind of contrivance, right? So um, I would have to say that at any moment in the process of writing, I mean, there are zillions of salient and important advices that writers could give beginning writers. I would give you this one. Um, the only responsibility you have as a writer is to be interesting to yourself. Be constantly engaged in the process of writing. Because even if the reader doesn't care about your story, it's not their cup of tea, 
they respond to the energy. Energy is transferable and contagious. The reader senses that. The reader senses something was written in a state of engagement. Whatever it takes, humor, vivid recollection, something that bothers you, something that excites you, be interested and engaged in the process of writing at any given moment in time. If it's not happening, find the way to ha for it to happen. Maybe insert a passage from something entirely different, doesn't have anything to do with this particular story, but it will boost the level of your energy and somehow may be appropriated by the story. Right? Because if you are writing something that is, you feel needs to be there for logistical purposes in the story, that's something that basically should be there, but your heart is not in it, and you feel that you are basically going through the motions of writing, right? Slightly spinning your will. Rest assured, the reader will sense that tenfold. Because if energy is transferable, so is the lack of energy. And the reader will sense that. And, and we'll stop reading. We'll stop reading. So, again, when you, and it's a good way of dealing with writer's blog, by the way. Do not think about people who will be reading this. Think about yourself. Be interested in the process of writing. You are your first reader. That said, of course, it's very important. What you're doing now is important. You're participating in a writing workshop. Writers need a community. Because I'll tell you that even the most accomplished writers feel slightly paralyzed each time confronted with blank screen or a blank piece of paper. And when you finish a piece of writing, you are never certain whether it's good or not. You have to have someone whose opinion you trust to tell you. And it cannot be somebody who has an active stake in your happiness. You don't ask your mother or you, you know, what do you think of my story? Oh, I love it, honey. It's beautiful. <laughs> don't. Don't ask people who want to make you happy. Surround yourself with writers who are in the same boat with you and who uh, will be friendly but honest, frank with you. You may or may not agree with them. Everybody has different taste. Something happens like along those lines, even the most famous currently writers, most accomplished writers start off their writing career getting lots of rejection slips from magazines. It's just inevitable. It's just inevitable. And it's not any kind of commentary on your skill as a writer. It's not about you. It's just that people have different tastes. Editors have different tastes. They make mistakes. They make mistakes. Sometimes, often, right? So make the process of writing worthwhile for you. Look, it's a solitary occupation. It takes up time and energy. Other people, while you're writing, are doing and some constructive stuff like diversifying their portfolios or stuff and you're just sitting here writing right make it worthwhile for yourself be interesting to yourself at any moment in time feel that you are doing something important you're telling stories that you feel are meaningful and you're doing it in a way that is interesting that would be my advice and there are all kinds of corollaries to this advice and there are all kinds of techniques of course to deal with the pros of writing. I mainly teach graduate creative writing workshop where I teach, which is in, at Concordia University in Montreal. And we have students from across North America, Canada, United States, and so forth. Um, these are people who have already made a commitment to writing, and it's a difficult commitment. Difficult in the context of their families because most of their parents did not dream of them being writers. They dreamed of them being lawyers or dentists or something. So. So it's slightly different. Uh, with begin, in beginning classes, when I teach them, we do lots and lots and lots of exercises. We do manuscript critiques, of course, and we do lots of reading. Because frankly, if you are only in it for the process of writing, but you don't like reading, writers stand on each other's shoulders. It's just that kind of occupation. You cannot, all the stories have already been told. All the styles have already been tried out. The only thing, component that we bring to the table is that our lives have not happened yet to other people. And so, well, that's why we write, because we feel that that's what we should do. It's a commitment. It's a commitment. And make this commitment easier and make it meaningful by writing only stuff that matters to you. So, right, Billy? Hmm? I've got a question. Yeah. Um, it has, this, this transition, you know, rapid, rapid, 
Well, there are numerous ways to answer that question, Billy. I could say, for instance, that I write uh, Russian sentences in English. Because <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, style, as the French writer André Gide said, style is the person, right? Yeah. And so we all have our inborn rhythms, yeah. we all have our predilections, and we are kind of recognize each other, not only by the timbre of our voice, but by the way we talk. It's trans and so when a person opens my book and then she says, oh, but that's, I immediately recognize the way you talk, for instance, right? So that's one thing. But uh, secondly, that's what, I mean, I've been pulled through my life, the trajectory of my life by commitment to literature and that pertains to lots and lots of other people as well. When I am with my students, graduate students, undergraduate students, we come from vastly different places and we grew up in different cultural systems completely. I grew up in the Soviet Union you know, totalitarian state and Russian culture. Uh, my students are from all across the United States, which is very diverse, you know, country, of course. Yeah. The regional differences are vast there, and yeah. Canada as well, as a matter of fact. So, but we're on the same page when we're in the classroom because we've made a, a, a joint commitment to literature. And it turns out if there is anything that I've learned, you know, by the, uh, uh, from my life is that the, 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 the similarities between people vastly greater than the differences between them, no matter where they come from, no matter their linguistic systems and cultural predilections. People are very similar in many ways. That said, the process of translation nonetheless, think about it, we don't really think in words, right? We think in thoughts, by and large. Clouds of thoughts. The process of translating thoughts into words is a, is a process of translation. The process of arranging words on a piece of paper or on a screen in a certain order is a process of translation. That's artifice. And then you realize that in order to be natural in fiction, you have to go through artifice. You have to be artificial. I'll give you an example. Some people say, class, like Hemingway dialogue. It's perfect. It's exactly like life, right? It's not at all. It's not at all. What Hemingway does, he just takes dialogue the way people just out of interest just tape your own verbal output over the course of one day and see how much white noise, how much water goes into that, right? What Hemingway does, he just basically squeezes all the water out of the dialogue, right? And then he dry freezes, right? He just like, and then he thaws it out and that's the dialogue. So in order to be natural, you have to be artificial. That's the, that's the great, the, the main uh, lesson of, of, of prose writing, of fiction writer. You can only be natural through artifice because it's art, it's art. It's not like you don't, otherwise we would just transcribe what people say to each other, but yeah. we don't do that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just thinking when you think of writers, who would you say, or who we generally consider a good writer? Yeah. What proportion of that would you say is the voice, just the writer's voice, and what proportion would be the actual understanding of all of these? <laughs> Techniques of writing and the squeezing and the transfusing. Um, yeah, just a thought. And uh, another thought, um, and question about trends. Because writing, sometimes I feel writing can run like clothing, fashion, and these trends to it. And maybe you're there, maybe you have a good story, you have a good voice, you have some technique, and it is polishing, but your audience is in a mindset. Uh, of another kind of trend um, and how to kind of resolve that if you still want to write? Well, I mean, you can only be yourself and you can write like yourself at any given moment in time. You cannot write better than yourself and you cannot write worse than yourself. You can only be yourself. And it's somehow just it kind of dovetails with what I uh, was talking about. Make a commitment to yourself in the process of writing and don't think about the audience. The audience will come 
if there is something genuine about your writing. Um, adjusting yourself to different trends um, is changing yourself in ways that may not be, maybe it's for some kind of career purpose, it, it serves its purpose, but it doesn't serve larger existential purpose in my mind. Um, so, so just be yourself, uh, I would say. And as to the proportion between, um, I think uh, the greatest of writers just feel, it's like Tolstoy said, you know, I'm just like you and uh, uh, the world comes at me from every angle, but life cuts me slightly deeper than you. Life has to cut you to, for you to be a writer, I think. It's, uh, it's the ability to feel strongly. It's ability, it's, it's something that you believe that your writing is important to you. There's something that you should be doing. I cannot uh, it, repeat it stronger enough. It must be something that you feel you should be doing because if you don't have that feeling, you may be wasting your time. There are more productive ways to spend your life. Um, more efficient. But if you want to write, then there is no choice. That's what you should be doing. Um, as for, you know, how you change with the times, life will take care of that. Life will change you, whether you want it or not, somehow. And the one thing, the only thing we can do is to at least recognize those changes. But life will change you, so why help life or go against the grain of life? Life will take you to a place where you belong, I believe. Well, very many, in very many instances, uh, writers are only recognized after their death, and that's the, the, the life happens in the aftermath as a postmortem, very often. But Dostoevsky, in his particular case, he was, of course, very, very famous during his life, and what happened to Dostoevsky started having epileptic seizure, fell and hit his temple on uh, the edge of the, of the writing desk where his uh, secretary was writing down what he was dictating to her, so he was 60 years old. Chekhov, who died at 43, uh, knew that he was dying since the age of 37 because he was a doctor himself. And uh, it's great regret that he didn't get to write because, you know, he could have written so much, so much more. No? Tolstoy died at 82. You know, nobody knows. Um, Nobody knows what the trajectory of one's life is going to be, what's the final point. But what can you do? You can only just write, if you want to write. If you want to write, you, you cannot really force yourself to write. Like I said, it's counterproductive in my opinion. You just have to feel that that's something that you should be doing. And if that's the feeling that you have, then all else is secondary, I would say. Everything else is secondary. Yeah, um, I don't translate in the process of writing. That would be impossible. The two languages, Russian and English, are not compatible enough. And so I'm not thinking in Russian and immediately translate it into English. I, I write directly in English and sometimes I reward myself for writing in English by writing in Russian. But, but, but um, 
but um, I long ago, I started, you know, when I started writing, I was, of course, presented with this uh, problem all the time. How do you explain, translate realities, the everything of your past into a foreign language where these realities makes no, make no sense? Um, and, and, and from the very first, I determined that I wouldn't be explaining anything. But I put those details and those sayings in the story, uh, mainly because putting details in your story makes it the process more interesting for yourself. The more concrete you are in the process of writing, the more interesting the process of writing becomes, and that's my goal, to make the process of writing as interesting for myself as possible. So I saturate my stories with details, with sayings, with translations into English of Russian sayings and so forth. It doesn't matter to me that the reader doesn't quite understand. Those who will, will want to understand will understand. The uh, reader understands more than we know, actually. Uh, that said, I have to say that, for instance, like the, the, the opening story here, um, and it's called The Night Andropov Died, and I don't know how many people here know who Andropov was. One person knows who Andropov was, but he was, uh, you know, um, Bre Leonid Brezhnev's successor. Brezhnev was the ruler for 18 years in the Soviet Union, General Secretary of the Politburo. And uh, he was a supremely dangerous uh, character. He only stayed in office for 14 hours and mainly in the hospital, but he managed nonetheless to push the world very much closer to the brink of nuclear disaster. So um, the story is kind of truthful. That's how I learned about his death while staring at the roller coaster one night at Leningrad Park of Leisure and Culture and Leisure and so forth. But when, I, uh, when that story was getting published in the New Yorker, my editor said, you know what, I think you have to include one paragraph as to who Andropov was. I said, are you kidding me, for the New Yorker? I said, you'll be surprised. And so, you know, if you read that, you'll see that there is a passage, kind of, not kind of in, in, in a Wikipedia kind of way, but in the kind of art, artsy kind of way, but I still had to include a passage as to who Andropov was, because presumably readers of the New Yorker magazine, some of them, wouldn't have known. So um, something will always be lost in translation. And we cannot write about everything. Uh, the writer who wrote beautifully about the impossibility of describing everything and dealing with everything in our lives was Borges, Jorge Luis Borges, the great Argentinian writer. Specifically, he has the story called Aleph. Um, and it's about the nature of writing, what writing is about, what it can and cannot do. The truth of the matter is that the writing is not very good at describing things. If I can take a photograph of a flower and then spend several years trying to describe that flower, the flower will be dead long before I describe it. I can just take a picture. Similarly, so writing is good for something different. Uh, similarly, if you read like the classic, like, you know, uh, 18th, 19th century literature, I don't know, Balzac and Paris, Dickens and London, right? You see how they're fairly vibrating with excitement of describing buildings. Essentially, you can learn the geography of old Paris and old London by reading Dickens and Balzac, let's say, right? That function of the writer has also been lost. You don't need to describe buildings anymore. You don't need to describe, everything has been described. You can look it up on Google Earth, you can look it up on maps, you can, you know. So writing is not about totally translating your life from one language to another. Writing is mainly dealing with what's most important to you about life. Just, just, be, just saying things that are really the most important. And in, in writing my story somehow when uh, I'm, I'm always, looking for a moment when the story is so interesting to me that it transcends language. I no longer care about the order of words in a sentence. I no longer rewrite sentences. I'm just in a hurry to lay it all out. And I know then that stories like that will not require lots of revision at all. They're almost like that. I'll just send them off to the editor. By the same token, however, 
quite often I try to approach a story in my, that is kind of hot in my mind in the same kind of frontal cavalry-like kind of approach, and the story immediately rebuffs me, immediately. And I know that, no, it's not going to be two hours, it's not going to be three hours, it's going to be a month with multiple uh, revisions. It's just that kind of story. So material always tells you how it wants to be dealt with, too. I don't know, it's a roundabout way of answering my question, your question, but I hope it answered to some extent. Uh, unfortunately, the, uh, our hosts are having an event here at the point three, so we have to break. Mm -hmm. um, but I just really want to thank you, Michelle, for coming to speak to us. Thank you so much. Uh, and guys, we'll be in touch about what happens next week, okay? Have, have a good day. All right.